a leader with emotion. Show emotion. All right? Now, people who have emotion are attractive. What do I mean by emotion? They, they show feelings. Right? So try to show feelings in whatever you are doing. Don't look just with a blank face. Don't be somebody who does not show emotion. All right? Number one, people who don't show emotion are usually not interesting to be with. Is that not so? The person's face is the same. It's usually not an interesting person to be with. You want somebody who is interesting, somebody who laughs, somebody who smiles, somebody who cries. But all these things show feeling. So some of you look in the mirror, look at your face, and look at it and realize that, look, your face is too straight. It's too unemotional, too serious, too unchanging. Do you understand what I'm saying? You need to work on your face. When I started the ministry, somebody told me, look, you don't smile. So I went to the mirror and practiced smiling. (laughs) Just stand there and smile. Until the smiling came a little more. Do you understand? Yeah, my wife sometimes tells me, you are very serious. And I'm a very serious person. That's why I need my wife. My wife is a lighter person. She lightens the environment around me. All right? So, emotional flowing is a very important thing because you are boring. Okay? How many want to be a boring leader? One of, one of the things that you must pray for in the ministry is to be attractive. Your church should be attractive. Do you see? Your church should be attractive. You understand? And you yourself should be an attractive person. Are you there? And so when you have no feeling, no emotion, no smiling, no nothing, you are not attractive. Okay? One day I went to a church and the pastor prayed such a cute prayer. And since then I always pray that prayer. He said, Lord, when the people come, bless them. And when they go, let them come back. And when they are coming back, let them come with more people. I find it such a great prayer for a pastor. Let them come back. And when they are coming, let them come with more people. And then I also realized that it's a spirit of attraction. Sometimes there's something attractive about a ministry or about a person. You understand? That is attractive. And I pray may you have the spirit of attraction on your life in Jesus' name. Amen. The next one. People who don't show emotion kill the atmosphere around them. Yes. For instance, if the people here don't show emotion, they kill the environment over here. And then I feel frightened of them. And I feel scared to continue preaching. What are they thinking that they are not saying? Number three, emotionless men and women are often strict. Too strict. Too authoritarian. Too exacting and rigorous and stern. You understand? So when when people are not attracted to, to very strict people, if you want people the church to grow. You can't be strict. Churches don't grow by being strict. That's why very melancholic people are usually not good pastors. When I say very melancholic, that you have to do this, do this, change this. Everything must be exact. Such people are usually not good pastors. You probably be a better prophet or an evangelist. I think Benny Hinn is a melancholic. The way he does things. And also maybe a sanguine. Do you see? Things don't grow around melancholic people. Who so strict. No, you. Why are you not doing? You are out. You are out. Get out. Move. Why, 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 are you, why are you smiling when we are serious? Why are you crying? I can't have soft, soft people here. Get out. And, and people don't flourish. Look, the church is made of good people, average people, partially good people, partially bad, very bad, 
very good, very evil. Huh? Everything is in a church. So if you are going to bang down, all average bad people should go away. Your church will be very small. You can't tolerate them. But you see, some of the average bad people, they are going to become good. After they stay in the church for six months, they will turn into be the very good people. Loyal. If you teach them, they themselves will grow and say, wow, thank God I came here. So we don't drive out people. You get what I'm saying? You don't kill people. Say, Lord, I pray, let him die. Let her die. You don't kill. That, that's, why, that's why you can never have authority unless you are deep into love. Because when you're not into love, you always be killing people. In your, you always pray Psalm 35. Let their way be dark and slippery. Let the angel of death chase them. Let them go down to the pit. Kenneth Hagin told a story of a pastor. He went to visit a guy and uh, he preached in the guy's church. And after the pastor got up, they were having supper. He was eating with the pastor and his wife. And the pastor got up to go to the toilet. So when he went to the toilet, he asked the wife, are you okay? He said, are you all right? He said the wife was afraid of the husband to talk or to share. Because he said as they were at the table, she was not talking. She was like a mouse. Hey. And he found out that the husband was very strict. The man had two children. So, Papa Hagen said, after he left, when the first child became, is it 18 or 21, the child said, I've had enough. I'm off. And he went. The second child got to 21 said, I've had enough of this prison and this giant, this wicked, strict man. He left. After the wife saw that the children have left and there is nothing else to do in the house apart from to be under this very strict guy, she said, I'm off. And he said the pastor died when he was 44 years old. That was the end of him. I thought, can I take his story? Then you die in the story. That's how the story ends. You die. <laughs> you cannot be too strict. I hope you understand what I'm saying. All right? The next one. Emotionless people are artificial. Because it is not true that you don't have emotion. It's not true that you don't like sex. It's not true that you don't like chatting. It's not true that you don't, you don't have feelings. You understand? You have feelings. Don't pretend. All right? Then the next thing is that you want to do is that people feel that if someone reveals his true... All right. The next one is, a show of emotion stirs up the emotions of others. When you are a pastor and you want to move the people, show emotion. Show them your feelings. And I learned this from Jimmy Swaggart. Jimmy Swaggart would preach. He used to wear his glasses. And uh, he preached very hard sermon. And at the end of his sermon, he would take off his glasses. Take off his glasses and start crying. Reverend Sack, isn't it? And when he cries, we all cry. Look, I used to, I used to watch him. And he did his altar call. That's how I learned how to do altar calls. He would keep the altar call and you'll be saved. You now you'll be saved. I used to watch and cry with him every time. That's why I'm good at doing altar calls. For, forgive me, Father. Do altar calls. Some of you don't watch enough to learn. Yeah. Altar calls for salvation. And he cried. So at a point I said, Lord, can you show me how to cry also? Because I want to cry when I'm preaching. Because when you cry when you are preaching, 
people also start crying. And there's a feeling that comes. So I tried and tried to cry, and the crying didn't come. <laughs> but I remember one day I went to preach somewhere, and I spoke about something, and I cried a little, and people started crying. I said, yes, Lord, it's working. <laughs> So try to show emotion and not look emotional. You are not happy. Ghana has won. And then you are just standing there like that. It's like, I'm the diplomatic, distinguished type. I'm, I, 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 I'm not into such things. No, please, please. I'm not easily moved. All right? Then the next thing is, people love to listen to a preacher who has a variety of emotions such as joy, anger, sadness, suspense, whatever. Now, it's just like films. We all love films which have sadness, joy, happiness, a bit of crying, victory, and obviously you should end on a good note that the person doesn't die in it. A, a good example is Rambo. The thing about it is that it begins on a sad note where he was put into prison for something that he hasn't done. Then hope comes. He is brought out of the prison, you see, by somebody who cares for him and who feels he's a good thing. Then hope continues. Then he falls, they throw him into the forest to go and rescue people, you see. And when he falls, who is the agent who is sent to help him? A young, beautiful lady. You see, and this young beautiful lady asked him, Rambo, why did they send you on such a mission? And Rambo answered, he was just uh, using his knife. He said, he explained, he said, the reason why they sent me to come to this jungle, to come and take photographs of prisoners, eh? a mission that I can easily not come back, he said, the reason is because I'm expendable. And then the girl asked him, what mean expendable? And he said, well, expendable? I can explain it this way. He said, if somebody invites you for a party and you don't go, and they don't even notice that you didn't come, that, that means expendable. <laughs> so you immediately feel so sad. It's like he's somebody who can die and they will not even notice whether he's dead or alive in the world. You see, that is why they sent him. And you feel so sad. Then suddenly, victory comes. He's able, he sees the prisoners. Then you see them so sad that he's able to save them. Then they're going victory, victory, victory. Then they shoot the lady and the lady dies in his hand. And the lady said, will you take me with me? He said, I will take you with me. And she dies and she dies. And, oh, you feel so sad. Then after that, anger. He's going to now go and kill the people. Do you understand? Right up to the end of the film. And, and do you understand? What, that's why it's a good film. That's why it's a good film. Because it keeps going up and down and happiness and sadness and love. But as for you, when you are preaching, you start, the Lord is a good God who has come into this world to bless us. Yesterday, I saw something that was encouraging to me when Ghana scored two goals to one. It is a great blessing from the Lord in the name of Jesus. Let us continue our sermon at this time by turning to Genesis chapter 4 verse 18. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 18, things are improving there by the grace of God. Yesterday I was with my wife when something happened and I saw something. Why? Even when you are telling us about the Ghana has scored, there's no feeling. There's no feeling. The people should see that you're also just like a normal person going up, you go down, you go up, you go down, you go. People like a real thing. Yeah, because everybody's life is like that. Every, the real life is like this, like this, like this. There's nothing that everybody's on top. My life is not always on top. Sometimes I'm so sad. Sometimes I'm praying. Sometimes I'm happy. Sometimes I feel victorious. Sometimes I feel useless. Every day. You understand? So people love to listen to a preacher who is. And not only, only up, it's not real. Anyway, Jesus Christ 
the, la- the last thing you should know about emotions, eight reasons why, no, this is eight reasons why people who show emotion are attractive. And the last reason is because Jesus Christ, our great example setter, showed emotion on many occasions. Five examples when Jesus showed emotion. Number one, Jesus was excited when he saw the man with great faith. The Bible says in Luke 7, 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Amen. Jesus wept. He cried. He was happy and amazed when he saw someone with faith. But on another occasion, he cried. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it. That means Jesus cried. (laughs) And John asked him, why are you crying? (laughs) I can't explain. (laughs) Lord, why are you crying? He said, because of Jerusalem. (laughs) You, you never cry over your town. You never cry over your city. You see why you are different from Christ? Jesus wept over the towns that he was sent to. Amen. Number three, Jesus was moved with compassion for the lost. And when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. People want to see someone who is feeling. The next one, Jesus was angry. How come you never get angry? Don't be worried when you get angry sometimes. A Christian pastor must get angry. And the Jewish Passover was at home, and he went into the temple, he saw them, and when he had made a scourge, he drove them all out. Hallelujah. And overthrew their tables. All right? And then the next one is, Jesus wept over individuals. He was sad about individual people. Just one person would make him sad. And Jesus wept, and he said to the Jews, then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. You cry over just one person. Does one person make you sad? It should touch your heart sometimes how one person feels. Amen. Amen. One day, I was talking to uh, a lady, and uh, she said she had missed her husband because her husband had traveled. So I said, when did your husband travel? So a few days ago. When she said that she had missed her husband, I felt so sad immediately because I remembered another young lady just like her whose husband had died. And I thought to myself, wow, this one's husband has traveled and her husband is going to come back. But this one's husband has gone and her husband will never come back. And immediately I felt sad. I was in uh, Malaysia on uh, Mother's Day and the they were giving out uh, presents to mothers. So they asked all the mothers to stand. So the mothers stood. A lot of women did not stand. And I looked back and I saw a lot of women who were not standing. because They were not mothers. You see. And I felt sad. But I didn't know somebody was watching me. It was the pastor's wife. She was watching me. And then afterwards, when we went, we sat down. She said, something to my wife and I was there she said your husband he has a very tender heart and I saw what he was looking at on mother's day because he was he was so touched and concerned for those who were not mothers he he looks very strict when he's preaching but he has a very soft heart that's what she said I didn't say anything to her but she could see it do you understand I mean you must think about people and feel and it, it must show that you feel. And it, it, it hurts you. Things that hurt people hurt you. But not that you are a feelingless robot. Do you see? Made of steel and metal. You know? Not affected by anything. Hallelujah. That's what makes you like Jesus. Jesus wept over just one. He wept over the city. But he wept over one person. And you notice that you are not affected by just one person's difficulty. But here is somebody who is affected. And I was surprised when she said that. She said, your husband, he's got a very tender, soft heart. A 
because I saw him. All that he was concerned about was the others. You see, maybe who were not mothers. Wow. Do you say amen? Amen. How many are feeling the emotion? You are feeling the emotion of the message. Yes. Now, the next one is take your privileges at the right time and for the right reason. Amen. What do you think? Ecclesiastes chapter 10 is a very important chapter with verse 5 to 7. It says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an arrow which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low places. I have seen servants on horses, and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Now, this is an error. When the prince is walking as a servant, and the servant is rather riding on the horse. So, you must be a good leader, but there are times also you must take the privileges that are being given to you and you must actually use them. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. And you must allow yourself to use them. Amen. All right? So there are times when the error, are you there? The, the error is not to take your privilege. Amen. All right? Your error is not to take your privilege you need to take the privilege at times. And that is also part of the commandment of God. It says, it is an error that proceedeth from the ruler. It means it's the head's fault. Now, this particular error is something that um, many churches, right, have made a mistake about. When the pastor needs to have a car, or a car even to travel, Instead of the church to just simply buy what it needs to buy, they go and do some special fundraising in the church. Do you see? As though it's a special privilege that we want to honor our pastor and love our pastor and so on. And they use that whole thing to make something that should not be done really maybe in that way. It's nice if the church will come together and buy the car. But what I want to say is that when it is time for you to have a horse to ride on, brother, it's not anything special. The church should just buy it and just use it. Simple and short. It's not anything special. When it's time for you to use toilet roll in your house, we don't have to come and make fundraising in the church. So our pastor doesn't have toilet roll. He doesn't have soap. He doesn't have uh, rice at home. We want to take a special offering to buy toilet roll and rice. No. Same thing as a car. And some of these, or a house that you should live in. It's not anything that we cannot have. So when it is time for you to have some of those things, then brother, it should just happen without much ado. You get what I'm saying? Because me, I have been a pastor where they did fundraising for me to buy a car for me. It's a very different thing when the car is just simply bought because it is your turn to have a car. When you are working in the bank and they need to do you, for you to have a car, they don't go around asking everybody for pennies. Oh, can you give a penny? We want to buy a car for one of our managers. Oh, everybody continue. He's a very nice person. He's done so much for the bank. He has worked in the bank for years. Oh, he's a, he deserves to have a car and so on. Oh, oh, God will bless you if you help him. Oh, why don't you give? How much have you given? Oh, give more than that. Oh, can't you give? Oh, those in the department finance have given those in the de treasury department have given. You will not give in your department. Oh, you are wicked, oh. Why are you do doing that in the bank? Oh, you should be kinder. Let us give to our manager. Our manager is a very good person. God has been, has been with us for eight years. Is it not right for him? Let's have a teaching about why our manager should have a car. Hey. It's never done. What is needed is done. Finish. As how many churches have had crisis in Ghana? over cars. And God told me some years ago, don't let your church go into crisis because of a car. Never let a car bring you into a crisis. A car is nothing. Can I have an amen? amen. Are you excited yes. about what I am saying? Yes. 
When it's time for you to sit on a horse, sit on a horse. Now, there is a problem. That is why we said, take your privileges at the right time and for the right reason. Okay? For the right reason. Now, what is the right reason? The right reason is the reason which is need, for which something is needed. Do you understand? Now, when somebody is working in the office and the person needs a computer, I do not say it's a privilege. It should be bought because the person will use it to work. How many understand what I'm talking about? It's not something special. Why does he have a new computer? Why does she have a computer? Why does she have a photocopier? They use the photocopier all the time. Why does he have that big car? Because he's the one who is traveling all the time. He needs it. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, the Bible gives us a scripture which is an amazing revelation. Are you listening? Yeah. Are you there? Yeah. About uh, taking your privileges for the right reason. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 16, it says, Woe to thee, O land, or woe to thee, O church. When thy king or thy pastor is a child, and when thy associate pastors eat in the morning, or take their benefits early, too early in the morning, taking your benefits in the morning is the same as taking your benefits too early. Do you get what I'm saying? Earlier than you should take them. He says, woe to you, O land, when thy king is a child, and when thy princes eat in the morning. It means, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. That means that your church has a big woe. Your ministry has a big woe. Amen. Amen. Woe to you. Woe to you. Woe to you. Woe to your church. When the pastor insists on eating first before anything else happens in the church. But it says, blessed art thou, O land. When thy king is the son of nobles. That means he's already used to wealth. He's already used to money. He's already used to riches. And when thy princes or thy associate pastors eat in due season. In due season means at the right time. And they eat for strength and not for drunkenness or for pleasure. In other words, what a blessing to have a leader who eats what he should eat at the right time. And the reason why he takes those benefits are for strength or something that will make him stronger. So if I fly in a plane and I sit at a particular part of the plane and it will make me stronger, then it's a blessing. But if I fly in a way that will make me weaker, then it's not a blessing. If I drive a car in a way that will make me stronger, then it is a blessing. But if I just drive in the car, like somebody said, you buy this car to enhance your image. One pastor gave an interview once and he was asked, why are you buying this Mercedes? He said that a car enhances your image and shows who you really are. You see? And that people relate with you based on the type of car that you have. Do you get what I'm saying? And so he, so he was explaining why he had bought that type of car. Do you get what I'm saying? But you see, now, in, in a sense, it is true that people relate with you sometimes based on the car. Sometimes you go, people come out, they look, they look at you, what car you came with, how you came, how you're going, and so on, and, and so on. It is true that people look. But you see, as a spiritual person, you must not intend to please people or to impress people. If somebody is going to look down on you, you know, like that. I remember one time I went to uh, Nigeria. For the, that was the first time I met with Bishop Oedipo. Somehow, I don't know how we, I think we flew. So we hired a little bus and I was with 12 of my pastors. Remember? And then we were in this air van bus. 
Do you see? And here I was coming to meet this big bishop. And when he, we finished meeting with him, he came down to see me off to the car. And which car do I have? There was this Evan bus that we were all struggling to get into and so on. With all these uh, people, we were like crammed inside the bus like um, sardines. Alex, do you remember? Yes. But you see, that's his problem. If he will assess me based on the car that I came to, so then he's gonna, he's, that is his problem. And, and, and you, you, if you want to know more, you will know there's more to this person than the car that you see he seems to be coming with. Are you listening to me? Yeah? But I, it occurred to me. Alex, did it occur to you? It did. Jake, did it occur to you? You discussed it seriously. Yeah. It occurred because people assess people in that way. But you see, it is God who um, makes a way for you. It is God who elevates you. It is God who puts you where you should be anyway. It's not a car. So I, I don't need to drive a Benz to show, although we could afford a few Benzes. I don't drive a Benz. And I don't think I'll ever drive a Benz. I mean, in terms of my official car, maybe I may drive it occasionally, have somebody's Benz or a Benz that I can just use around. But it's not a car that I'm going to, or BM. There are some red carded cars. They have, they have red cards on them, or yellow cards. Some are red card, yellow card cars. For pastors. It's like you, you bought that car for, for the sake of showing wealth and strength. Do you understand? So, I often avoid that particular, although I know that the best car is Benz. And if I was to choose a saloon car, that is the best car that I would like to have is a Benz. But I, I will not drive it. Because I don't think it will help me or strengthen me in my work. Yeah, it's a good move. I don't think it will help me. I don't, know. I, don't need, I don't need any extra problem. I can get a car that is as good as a Benz or even better than a Benz. Sometimes even the Benz is cheaper, but the Benz will give you more trouble. This is what people don't realize. A president of a poor country, you are going to buy a jet. More problems will come to you. Remember the last government, you see the problem they had over that presidential jet that they went to to bring. Yes. So many, 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 many problems. And you see even now, they say they are building a presidential palace. You see, it brings up, because the whole question is that, why are they doing these things? I'm not saying it's good or it's bad. Because we also need a presidential palace. But why are they doing all these things? Is it for strength? Or is it for pleasure? Or is it for drunkenness? Is it for security? Huh? Or is it enhancing your image? The reason behind is very important. So if it costs me so much money to get a car that is safe, I will get it. If that is it, I will get it. So brothers and sisters, do things for the right reasons. Why are you going to England? Why are you going to America? What's the reason? For strength? For money? For drunkenness, for pleasure. Why? Ask yourself. Let us do the ministry in the right way. Amen. Amen. For strength and not for drunkenness. Hallelujah. Amen. God makes everything beautiful in his own time. Amen. And today, I don't need a Mercedes Benz. To make me. How many think I Mercedes Benz will make me more famous? Do you think it will make me better in the ministry? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Yes. Mercedes Benz is not going to make me greater and more fruitful, stronger. An S class Mercedes Benz. So that you see a pastor of a small church with a wild Benz. Hey. You look and say, my goodness. 
and the church does not have a building. There's no building. No building, no instruments in the church. And the pastor comes with his gleaming, shiny. Huh? S class, super S Princess Diana type of Mercedes Benz. You don't have instruments. Your pastors don't even have. You see, for me, I like my pastors to have things. Not that I'm the only one who has. If we all have something, then we all have something. But not that I'm the only one who is driving. Wow. And they are just nothing. Don't, don't be a leader of nothings. Be a, be a leader of somebody's. Amen. Hallelujah. Many of us, we don't have houses because we want to have houses in the posh areas. We want to have a house in a big, nice area of Accra or of wherever you are. And your house must be so big. A mansion, a palace. Because you feel that this reverend has a palace. And there are three floors in his house, 17 bedrooms, 16 toilets. Hey, if I was to rise up now and say that I want to build a lighthouse palace for the bishop and the founder of the church, it will not be easy in the church. Hey, all the projects in the church will stop because it will cost at least a million dollars to build it. Yeah, it will be more than the basilica. The things that will be in the house. The gadgets. The furnishings. From Paris, from Milan. From here. Wow. It will not be easy in the church. Everything has to stop for my palace and my mansion. Maybe God will one day give me a mansion, even on earth. Perhaps for strength. Yeah. But for now, I cannot see how it will strengthen me. <laughs> so, I just live in a neighborhood where I have lived for all these years without any project or plan of moving from there. And I'm blessed. There's no road to my house, but I'm blessed. Yeah. That's it. Where I stay... When people, are, when people come to Ghana and say they are coming to rent out, they never come to that area. They cannot. That area is out. They rent at this side, not at the other side. The other side. All right. Are you happy in the church? The next one. Overcome the disadvantages of youthfulness and inexperience by studying history. Amen. Every Christian must study history. Amen. What do you think? Huh? Yes. Is it a good move? Right? Every Christian. Why should you study history? Because Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 says, The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time which was before us. Amen. Four reasons why every leader must study history. Number one, history is the second greatest source of knowledge and wisdom after the scriptures. All right? I believe that apart from the scripture, history 
History is far more important than geography. And it really hurts me that I didn't do history in school. Now, it's too late for me to do history. So what I do is that I buy films that are historical and I watch them. Yes, so I will watch a film about Alexander the Great, which maybe I didn't have the opportunity, like my wife, my wife studied history. And she studied, what are the things you studied in history? Second, First World War, causes of the First World War, the Second World War, the remote causes and the immediate causes of the First World War, French Revolution, and what else? The, what was the wars of Europe, the Western Tea Party, Boston Tea Party, and what else? American independence. And what else? Africa, Mali, Ghana, Zonga Empire, Songa Empire, Nigeria, the Igbos, Oyo states. You see how much she knows. And I don't know any of these things. I don't know the immediate causes or the remote causes of the First World War. Do you know? It's the same cause of the war in your church. First World War and Second World War. The same cause is the cause of the war in your church. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. It's the same cause. It's, there's nothing new under the sun. It's the same thing that caused the Second World War. It's the same thing that will cause the Third World War. And you begin to know what is going to happen. Why fights begin? Why battles start? And why they never end? If you can understand. You see, so history is one of the most important subjects. So, if you are like me and it's too late to learn history, watch historical films. You understand? Like I was watching once on the History Channel, how the um, how the the uh, the secret of the nuclear bomb was stolen from America and was given to Russians. How an American stole it and gave it to the Russians. An orangu who worked in a factory. He worked in a factory where they were doing it and he was a physicist and he copied the drawings and through his wife and they would type and visit him and, and, and how you could have seen that this guy was an orangu to America from his pro-communist proclamations in school and before. Science of disloyalty. And such a person was admitted to work in the factory where they were doing the nuclear physics experiments. And he transmitted everything through his wife. And that, that, I, what, I forgot the name of the trials. But in the end, he and his wife were executed. They had two children. And they called it the greatest crime of the century. They called it to have sold that thing. And what happened was that they couldn't discover them because they could not decode the code that the Russians were using. So they were sending messages to America back and forth from America to Russia for years, but they couldn't. But after the World, the world War, after Russia had got the secret, about so a few years later, they discovered the code. So they now decoded all the messages and they found who had been transferred. Because it took them years to decode the Russian code. Then they found messages were coming to this person, to this person, to this person, and they traced all of them and they got them. And they tried and they had children. They executed husband and wife. They executed two of them. They showed them in the dead in the coffin like that. They killed them. And, and the brother of the girl. Different things, but you learn. Orangus. Even Saddam Hussein would never have been caught if somebody had not told the man is here. Always it is somebody inside. Always, always there's somebody inside who is somewhere. And you learn it from history. And if you don't know history, 
you never know that this is how all great people are brought down is from somebody inside and you are the next great person in the system so you should know that the way you are going to be brought down or the way you are being brought down is by somebody around you mercy forgive one of my church members was just telling me a few days ago that they just discovered somebody who was stealing money in their company to the tune of billions of cities billion they were saying how many she was saying how many billion they have stolen they work with them they work with them and they steal the money they have been doing it and i was saying you could have given all that money to the church as an offering wow so overcome the disadvantages of your youthfulness by doing what studying him like for instance i don't really need to study the history of rawlings because i was a student when he came into power so it's very fresh in my life you understand it's very fresh in my life but people who are 10 years old they they even 20 they need to read it they need to understand it because what will happen is that another person will come one day and rise up and say hey this 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 that and then the students at legon they don't remember we were there and they used to shout they used to say j j j j junior jesus junior jesus j j and then they said let the blood flow and they wrote in red pen all over the campus let the blood flow let the blood flow let the blood flow let the blood flow and the blood flow it flowed really and a lot of people were killed but those of us who were there because of we know history when we see another sergeant rising up and we say look we were in ghana some years ago when a similar thing happened this is how it ended you will not be happy with it so history will make you wise history will make you know history will make you take a better way so read history is apart from the bible in fact history the word history is actually the word his story it's actually meant to be the story of christ his story hallelujah now the next thing history the scriptures themselves contain many history lessons that guide us amen the scripture the book bible itself is a history book so when you read the bible you just have to see how kings were overthrown what they did what happened number three god instructed i'm telling you why you must study history all right why you must study history okay now god instructed his leaders to teach history amen in deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 he says and these words which i command thee this day shall be in thine heart and thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down amen and when they shall ask you what mean these testimonies then thou shalt say to thy son we were pharaoh's bondmen the lord brought us out of egypt the lord showed signs and wonders upon egypt and upon pharaoh and upon all his household before our eyes tell your children what happened amen, amen. tell your children how daddy met mommy how mommy met daddy and what you did and what you didn't do they don't know teach them how the lord blessed us one day very soon we are going to leave this place by god's grace many people may come and not know even that we were even here and they may not even know how we came here and how we suffered and how we were driven out and how we did this and how we did that and i will say every year when we have homecoming we take people around the sites and people are really touched and moved when they go to these historical places of this little church because they can see how the lord has brought us 
and how the Lord has been good to us. It helps you to understand the power of God when you see the history of the thing. Are you there? All right. The next one. History repeats itself. History repeats itself. You are walking where others just like you have walked. If you know what happened to them, you will know what will happen to you. There is a proverb that says that those who do not know history are doomed to repeat history. You are walking where others have walked. If you started a church, others have started a church. If you are a pastor in this town, others have been pastors in that town. If you have been an evangelist, others have been evangelists before you. If you are a singer, others have been singers. So you must study the history of singers. Is that not so? That's the history of what happened to other singers. Why did some singers never do well? Why do some singers do well? What is the history of Ron Kenoli? What is the history of Andre Crouch? What is the history of um, Darling Check? What is the history of Keith Green? Why did they do well? Why did they not do well? And you educate yourself, especially so that you know what is going to happen to you. You will know that you'll be famous. If you are a singer, one of the things you learn when you read is that you'll be famous and popular for a while, and after a while, you'll not be famous and popular. You should know what's going to happen to you. For a while, you, everybody will choose you. Everybody will play your music. Everybody will listen to your CD. And after a while, they won't listen to your CD, even though you are still good. Yeah. A, a, a wonderful, eh? I can remember one series, Maranatha. You know Maranatha? Maranatha are the people who brought us those songs. What are some of the songs? In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. That is one song. What other song is there by Maranatha? Huh? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies, as we gather, may your spirit work within. Is that from Maranatha? What else? One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after. Okay, I don't know that one. One thing have I desired of the Lord, I will seek after. I may dwell in the house of the Lord for the days of my life. Okay. The beauty, the beauty of the Lord to desire in his presence. Temple of okay, that's Maranatha. And then there's another one. What else? Shine, Jesus, shine. Now that others may be dark in between. That's another one. Another one. Jesus, your name is power. Jesus, your name is Jesus, your name will every stronghold. Jesus, your name. That's another one. What other one is there? Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. Let your kingdom be with without praises. As your people declare your mighty name, blessed be the Lord, God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord, God Almighty. Who reigns forever. What else? What else is there? Jesus, how lovely you are. You are so gentle, so pure and so kind. You shine. 
like a bright morning star, Jesus, our love Let's forget about ourselves, concentrate on Him and worship Him. Let's forget about ourselves. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. Let's forget about ourselves. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. Star Lord, oh, worship Him. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Is it not powerful? And what other song? He is able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. He is able, he's more. can handle anything that comes my way. He is able, more than able, to do much more, to do much more. I could ever dream. Unfold you with his spirit and his love. Let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, oh, let him have the things that hold you and his spirit red like a dove will descend. Upon your life, Amen. Hallelujah. Is it not wonderful? Where are all these songs today? That is what is going to happen to the songs that are around today. It's what has happened to the songs that were there. And then after that, we had. Uh, integrity music and they also came up with so many beautiful songs like which ones lift him up his name is lifted higher lift him up it's on his holy name lift him up his name is lifted higher Exalt his holy. And we used to sing rock and only songs. What were the other songs we used to sing? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy. That's the kingdom of God. Part of the kingdom. Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Come on. Come on, everybody. Part of the kingdom. Hey, part of the kingdom. Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Come on, everybody. He 
turn my morning into dancing again. It's lifted. Comfort, he brought comfort like a I feel the sweetness of his love piercing my dark, piercing my darkness. Yeah. I see the bright and morning as he ushers in, as he ushers in. I can stay silent. I must sing for his joy. Uh, sit down now. It's not praise this time. What other song did we sing? Yeah, the song. Ancient of Days. Okay. Yeah. A blessing and honor, glory and power. All of creation, all of creation, bound for bound before the ancient blessing and honor. Bless the Lord, shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In passion, you will be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom shall not pass away. Shall reign, your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing, sing to the ancient of days. For now, can compare to your master's word. Sing to the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. You're the solid rock on which I stand. Solid rock on which I stand. There is a one. By the Christ, there is a one. Upon the throne, love we sit upon the throne. Tenderness is for you. Tenderness is for his own. What other song did we sing? There's Be a song magnified. you used to sing. When you sing, then we answer. No. No, 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 no. He walked where I walk. He walked where I. He stood where I stand. He felt what I feel. He understands. He understands. He knows my frailty. He knows my frailty. He shared my humanity. Shared my humanity. Tempted in every way. Tempted in every way. Without sin, yet without sin.
Sit down. Why are you standing? What I'm trying to say is that now after Ron Kenoli's songs, then what other songs came? Here came Shout to the Lord. Then Darling Check came. Darling Check. What are Vineyard songs? Um, the fire, there's a wind a, bl- a-, a blowing, yeah, it's fire and storm. But shout to the Lord, let us sing. When majesty prays to us, bow down and we'll roar at the sound of your name. Joy at the word of your hands forever, forever I love you, forever I stand in. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. And there was this guy who used to sing his songs to his South African guy. Oh Lord, pour out your, your spirit upon the peoples of the earth. Let your sons and daughters speak your word. Speak your word of prophecy. Show us, O oh Lord, show us dreams and visions. Reveal the secrets of your heart. Reveal. The secrets of your heart, oh Lord, our faith is rising, is rising. Oh, you used to sing it. Let the heaven sound, the coming of the day. Hey, that's gonna be a great awakening. That's gonna be a great revival in our land. That's gonna be a great awakening. Speak your word, speak your word of prophecy. Show us dreams and visions, show us dreams and visions. Reveal the secrets, reveal the secrets of your heart. Lord, our faith, Lord, our faith is rising. Let all heaven sound the coming of your day. That's gonna be a great awakening. Yeah. That's gonna be a great revival in our land. That's gonna be a great awakening. And everyone who calls on Jesus' name will be saved. Thank you. Sit down. Where are all these? 
they have disappeared. Huh? Powerful song. But before these ones disappeared, there were earlier songs that disappeared. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. There's of salvation, purchased of God. My brother, my friend, my, my prophet, prophet, priest, and king. Oh! My Lord, my, my life, my way, my end. I accept the praise. And woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. What a friend we have. Peace. 
Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. To His feet I tribute bring. At some healed, restored. should tell you that the songs we are singing today eh, will also pass away. How, no matter how powerful they are. Through all the changing seasons. Through all the changing seasons. History is scary. I just had a vision. It's like I saw the pastors, dead pastors. It's like they're all standing here and all saying, You'll be like us soon. You're going to go. You all go. It's true. 
Your days are numbered. You'll soon be in a coffin. You'll be, you'll be mixed up into sand. You vanish. So be wise. I once had a vision. Two pastors who had died came to my house. They had risen from the dead. And they came to this earth in the vision. And what happened was that they had come and they had been on earth to different churches they had helped to start. And they had pastored and they had been involved in singing songs and so on. And they had final, their final visit was to visit me before going back to be with the Lord. And they were sitting in my house, in my sitting room at the dining table. I was there, the two of them were there. And they were eating and they were talking. So we are going back. So I asked them, how was your visit? And they said, well, there are three things that we want to tell you. Number one is, first of all, we were very surprised when we died because they were pastors. The two of them were pastors. And they were very, said we were very surprised when we died. But we never thought we would die at the time that we died. We thought we would live for a long time, but we, did, we were not expecting to die. And that's what I'm saying that it's like there are pastors standing here, all of us saying, saying that you'll be like us soon. Do what you can do and do it to the very best of your effort. Think about eternity. Think of the future. Don't just think of what you are doing and think that it's soon going to be over and you'll be like one of those ghosts who stand and say, you'll be like us. You'll be like us soon. You'll be just like me. You'll turn into nothing soon, just like me. You'll be just like me. Reverend Anna, yes. Your father came to your mind. This man's pastor came to his mind when we were singing. And this one remembered um, his own father. The hymns. His father was a priest. And these priests are gone. These pastors are gone. And they are saying, you be like us. This guy said, we never thought we'd die. Number two, they said, when we went around the churches, our songs didn't work anymore. He said, we tried to revive the songs. But people were not interested in our songs. They wanted to sing the, their new songs. But they didn't want our songs. And then he said also our teachings. People were not interested in our teachings. The old teachings we used to teach. They had new teachings and they were into those things. And then he gave me that last. I said, there's a vision of dead people. And they told me the last thing. He said, you have the best chance now. Do what you have. That's what they said. He said, you have the best chances. We have nothing. We cannot contribute. You have the best chance now. And that was the end of the vision. Hey! Today, ghosts are advising us and are saying, you will join us sooner than you expect. Just give it your very best. Put in all. Think of eternity. One day, I had a like, kind of a word of wisdom. I was sitting with a pastor. I was just about sending him to a country. I think Botswana or something. And suddenly the spirit of the Lord came on me and I told him, I said, and I knew that it was a word from the Lord because afterwards I thought about what I had said. I told him, I said, always think like a dying man. Always think like somebody who's just about to die or like a dying man and you'll be very wise. When you think of death or that you may die soon, you become very wise. You make a will, you will do things for eternity your ministry will be thinking of God, eternal things, not things that are making you permanent here. That's why I give you these books with joy. If you read all, I would give every one of you a set of all my books. If only you will read it. I'll give you everything free. It has no value to me on earth. It's only a spiritual thing. Yes. It has, it has no, there's no financial value whatsoever to me. It's just a spiritual. Yes, say something. Yeah, it's like this morning after I prayed, I heard a voice, but it was like my, my wife's voice was telling me that whatever will be said today, take it very serious. So I believe that what Bishop is saying, we ought to take it very, very, very serious. believe it. There's no value to all that we are doing unless it has eternal value. Even our churches and our ministry, that's why you have to really pray and be led and be sure that God wants you to do the things that you are doing. 
Because you see, Paul preached and he started churches, but today, those churches have turned into mosques. And there's no church there. But his writings, the letters he wrote, those are what are being used. Even in this conference, Paul is ministering. His words are speaking to us. It has lasted. That's eternal fruit. May God, may God open your eyes to recognize and to realize the things that he desires from you and that are spiritual, that are eternal, that have everlasting effects. Oh, may God touch you. May God touch your heart. May he soften your heart. May he help you to see. It's such a mystery. I was a great is the mystery of godliness. Without controversy. It's so mysterious. But may God touch our heart to see. Where are these songs? Look at the songs. We sang the songs with nostalgia. With feeling. We, we were so moved. We remember what, what times. You sing a song and you can remember a particular day. You sing a song, you remember a moment in the church. You remember an hour. And you ask yourself, have the words of the song changed? They haven't changed. Have the meaning changed? Is the meaning relevant today? It's relevant, but why don't we sing it? It's almost like there are very few things which God uses for a very long time. When I go into the bookshop and I see Kenneth Higgins' books are not to be found in many shops, and he's, he's becoming historical. He just died two, three years ago. His ministry is already going off the scene. Idahosa from Nigeria. One day, Idahosa said something. He said 70% or 80% of all ministers in Africa are his products or products of his products. And I think it's probably true. He influenced many people and helped in Ghana. I can show you many, many churches all influenced by the host. Today when you go to Nigeria, you don't even have the slightest smell of his ministry. Vanished. You, you ask, how many know Idahosa? My pastor in London asked the church, how many know Idahosa? No, only two people knew of him. And yet there was a season when he was the greatest father. I was so privileged to sit in his in a car with him. I was so privileged to have he prayed for me on this stage right here. Archbishop Idahosa, he prayed for me here two weeks before he died. Yes. I believe that he passed on something to me. Two weeks before he died. He came into this room and he looked around and he said, Kneel down. Kneel down. And I knelt down and put his hand on me and he prayed for me. And he anointed me with oil. Wow. Today he's a ghost. Trying to reach you, but he can't. He can't speak. And we, we won't, the songs he used to sing won't work. There's a song that I remember he, he, he was he's teaching. He said, Abraham's blessings are mine. Abraham's blessings are mine. In the morning, in the evening. I'm blessed in the morning. I'm blessed in the evening. Abraham's blessings are mine. Simple song from the Archbishop. With all his robes. He'll sing with his robes in winter. And he'll, sometimes he'll be so cold. He, Jesus will save you. He was feeling cold. Preaching. Today he's gone. We can only read of him. It's wonderful. Oh. Mercy. Don't forget my vision. I shared it with you. Amen. Amen. Wow. The next important thing you must know about history is that many things are programmed in cycles. They go in cycles. This comes, then it goes. This comes, then it goes. This comes, then it goes. Okay? So, you must have that in mind. Amen? It's a cycle. So maybe you are at a part of your cycle. You get it? And so sometimes, like for instance, prosperity in nations. Somebody told me that countries tend to prosper every 10 years. And they lose their prosperity after another 10 years. 
So if you look at nations, you find out that they go through a cycle of like 10 years and then they go down. And then they go up and then they go down. Like Ghana is on the upward boom. Do you see? That's how come even the World Cup, we are, we have come so far. Do you understand my message? Yes. And Ghana is a place, it's a peaceful place. That's why many Nigerians have come to Ghana. And many African countries come to Ghana. And that's how come we are even here. There are many of you here, you are not even from Ghana. Many of you. It's it's a cycle. But it may change. Because if you look at Cote d'Ivoire, Cote d'Ivoire was also a very top nation with skyscrapers and so many things. And every person in you are coming to Africa, coming to Cote d'Ivoire. And I remember one day, I was invited to Cote d'Ivoire. And some people thought that it was, because it was Cote d'Ivoire, they said Cote d'Ivoire. So many people wanted to go with me. <laughs> so they all came along. Hey! Not knowing that Cote d'Ivoire had changed. It was very bad. And I was laughing in my head. I said, you thought we were going to Europe, so you were following me. But Cote d'Ivoire has just gone down. And it was going down, down, down. Then it went further and went into war. Which looked impossible because France has got troops. There's no British troops here in, in Accra. There are no troops here. There's no country which has troops in Accra. But in Cote d'Ivoire, they had 5,000 French soldiers, artillery, guns, everything, ready to protect, stabilize the nation. And still, a civil war came and has divided the country from, like, Kumasi upwards is for one group, and from below Kumasi is for Accra. And no one knows when it will ever end. Angola and so on, they were at war for about 20 years. It's possible that Cote d'Ivoire will be at war for the next 20 years. Hey! I sent one pastor to Angola. And even Nigeria, you are very blessed that your civil war has ended and the country looks normal now. Because Angola, at my pastor there, he said, look, when they came, he said, we give you AK-47. Everybody has AK-47. And he said, when they are having happy birthday, when they sing happy birthday, happy birthday to you, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. May God bless you now. 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 Amen. Then everybody takes his AK-47. <laughs> hip, hip, hip. <laughs> then they shoot. Everybody has one. Hey, <laughs> tell Hey, hey, hey. That is how they celebrate birthday. It's like it's like a toy that all the, because of the war. You see, when uh, the man was the man Jonah Savimbi was coming, then the government armed everybody. Everybody here is going to fight. We are going to fight him. We cannot come back. You see, and now that the war is over, everybody still has a gun. Nobody feels it, so everybody has one. Everybody knows how to shoot. How old are you now? 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 I'm 23 years old. I'm 23 years old. I'm 23 years old now. I am 23 years old now. May God bless you 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 now. Hip, 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 hooray! They are celebrating in Angola. That is how they celebrate. Uh, It is not easy to be a missionary. It is not easy. When the cycle turns like this. So if you are enjoying peace, sometimes that's why I was preaching yesterday. You know you have to know how to predict the future in a general way. Uh, this peace may not be here forever. It could turn. So while there is peace, look at uh, Somalia. They say a government has come now. They say they have vowed to make the country an Islamic state. Hmm? 
Now, how do you go and preach there? If you wanted to preach, you should have gone earlier. Mercy. Let's go quickly. Let's run quickly. That's what the ghosts were trying to tell us today. Go. We can't go. We can't contribute. Go. Go now. Do what you have to do. You have the best chance now. You have the best chance. That's what they told me. They told me three things. They said, number one, we were surprised. We were surprised. We thought we would live to be 70 because we were so good pastors, loving God, serving God. We thought we would be old. God would leave us on earth to live for a long time, forever and ever. But it didn't happen that way. God didn't have that mind. He didn't have the mind of 70 or 80. He had a mind of a particular time. And he did not reveal it to you. Number two, our things, the past things don't work anymore. In 20 years, what is working now will not work in the church. I'm telling you. It's not that we don't believe in it. And that is why I'm opening the church like the family like I don't want to restrict what blessing God has given to me to only people who started as Lighthouse Chapel. If there are others who sense God wants them to be part of this, Charlie, this is my best chance now. One day I'll be gone. And I can't help anybody. I can't do anything. I can't do anything to continue and help the work of God to go on. This is my best chance now. That's why I said, Charlie, look, you want it? Come now. I'm open. It's totally contrary to what I ever used to do or believe in. But if it can help, I'll do it. You have the best chance now. Amen. How many are coming closer into the realm of the spirit. Can you sense God speaking to you? I feel it. A student of history can predict the future. That's the next point. Number seven, boldness and confidence are the fruits of studying history. When you study history, you are bold and you are confident. Amen. You are bold and you are confident. When when, when you know rebellion, when you see somebody doing, say, look, I know you are in a book. You see, do you notice when I'm preaching, I tell you a lot of stories. Do you know what I'm telling you is actually history? Yeah. Yeah. So when you know that history very well, when you see somebody come say, but I, I, I read about you, I heard about you, I've seen you. What do you think? Is it supernaturally powerful? Now, the next point is also a very eternal point. It says, take responsibility and give account. In other words, prepare to give account. Huh? You will give an account. Doug Heward Mills will give an account of all that he was given. Hey, do you people pray for me? Can you imagine what my judgment will be like? Huh? To whom much is given, much is required. It's so scary. So look, if you are in charge of your church or your ministry, be strong. Don't be timid. Be very strong. And take charge. Because remember that you will give account also. So be strong. Because you will account. Some years ago, we had a coup in Ghana. And the soldiers took over. And they arrested the heads of state, the ministers, and they executed them in Ghana. They shot them down the road here, and they shot them on national TV. Why didn't they shoot you? Because you have not been a head of state. They shot those who took responsibility. And those who take responsibility will give account. So you were left, I was in my house when they shot them, but they never came for me because I have never taken charge of Ghana. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you must realize that you will pay for the things you are doing. So if you are doing, do it well. Know that you are the one who will be held accountable. That is why up till today I'm still alive and I was not shot at Teshi because I never took over. I never made myself a head of state. Never have I made myself minister of health, minister of this, minister of that. So when they are arresting, I'm out. <laughs> you, you've made yourself a pastor. Well, better do it well because one day all pastors will be arrested in heaven. 
and will be brought for trial. And you will be asked questions. And the, and the Lord will ask you, why were you so soft? Why didn't you do what you had to do when you knew? The Bible says God speaks once and he speaks twice. Then we don't seem to hear. Then he speaks to us in visions and dreams. Then we don't seem to hear. Then he gives us troubles. Three levels of hearing from God. He speaks to us once and then twice. After that, he gives us visions and dreams in the night. When we still don't hear that, he comes to troubles. Mercy. Try to hear God. One way or another, try to hear God speaking to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because you will be held accountable for everything. God will judge you. God will make you pay. A young flight lieutenant came to our country and he made those who called themselves head of state, he made them pay with their lives. Because they said they were in charge. They said, okay, if you are in charge, come. Where is our money? Where is the gold? Where is the cocoa? Where is the timber? Where is it? Stand here. Fire! When I, when I put my hand, I say, fire! Fire! Go, 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 go. You, where is our silver? Where is our gold? Where are the riches? Where are the roads? Where are the hospitals? Where are the schools? Fire! Go, 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 go. You, you say you are minister of roads and highways. Where are the roads? Where are the highways? Where is that Temamoto way to Cape Coast? Not there. Fire. Go, 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 go. You, you are a minister of water and sewage. Where is the water? Why is there no water in Accra? Go, 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 go. Fire. You, you are a minister of health. Where is the hospital? Where are the doctors? Why are they all in America? Shoot him. Go, 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 go. Hey. So you, you say you are a pastor. One day they'll say, you come. Where are the sermons I asked you to preach? Where are the messages I asked you to preach? Where are the churches I asked you to plant? Where are the souls? Angel, fire. Next one, come. Where are the books I asked you to write? No book. Shoot, shoot. When I, when I lift my hand, shoot. I asked you to help this man. Why did you to help him? Come. You be told us. I thought I was going to heaven. Yeah, this is heaven. You are too proud to do what I asked you to do. Take responsibility and remember that you will give account. So if you know you don't want to give account, then leave the work now and sit down. Mercy. The next point is don't give up your source of power, which I believe is the greatest. Amen. Acts chapter 6 verse 2. It says, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Amen. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Amen. All right? Are you there? Samson's source of power was his hair. Right? Then he told her his heart. In Judges chapter 16, verse 17. Then he told her his heart. And he said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak, and I shall be like other men. Amen. It is not reason that we leave the word of God and serve tables. What is the source of your power in the ministry? The source of your power in the ministry is God. It's God. God is the source of power. God is what makes you something special. Amen. 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 God is the one who makes you a special, special person. Amen. You wouldn't be here if it were not for God. Simple. God brought you where you are. If you wouldn't be here, if it were not for God, you'd be dead. You'd be, you'd be crazy. Some of you would be in a mental hospital. Did you know that? You would have been a freedom fighter. This man was one of the people who fought, for, fought against apartheid. 
Are you not one of the people who fought for apartheid, for freedom? You were in the struggle. He, he, he's a comrade. This, this man here. They would have killed him in Soweto. But he's here today because of Christ. Amen. God is the source of our power. Because of God you are here. So why do you then give up God in exchange for other things? God in exchange for people. That's, that's the source of your power. So all pastors try to have a time and a place where you always go and wait on God. Go there frequently. Even if it's every two months or every three months, go there. Just you and God. For one week and some days, call on God. Confess your sins. Pray for God's mercy. Pray for God to help you. Call on God to just have mercy on everything that is useless about you. And ask God to just show your, his mercy and his love. Because when I look at the ministry, I realize that the things that I plan to do, they don't work. The things that I have not planned, they are the ones that are working well. Look at me. I started branches. I never planned to start branches. Yet I look as though I'm a professional branch starter. Meanwhile, it was not a plan. Look at that. The things that I'm into, I never thought I would do. It's just God's grace. God took me to uh, South Africa. I was exposed to certain tents and certain things that opened me up to healing Jesus' ministry. But I didn't plan it. I, I was not in the house. I said, I'm planning to go there and go and get this from there and go and do it. No, just grace, grace, God's power, God's power, God's anointing, God's love. God's grace, God's mercy. So my friend, go to God. Go back to God. God is the source of your power. Find him. Lie before him. Stay with him. Call on him. Say, Lord, please help me. Those of you who have not fallen into sin up till now, it's not because you are good. It's not because you are great. It's because God has helped you. God has protected you. It's not, you are not a good type. I just want to tell you, you are not a good type. You are not a good type. It's just God's mercies and grace. You are not the moral kind. You are not the upright kind. You are nothing. You are the nothing kind. God's mercies and God's grace have kept you. So why do you stay away from the God? Go back to the God. Go to the God who gives you the help. Go to the God who is everything. The Lord is my light my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? Hmm? Shall I fear? When a host that comes around against me, my heart shall not fear. No war rise against me. This shall I be confident. I'll be confident because the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my defense. So where, where, how come you don't have much time for the Lord? Your mobile phone, your TV, your newspapers, your friends, your wife, your children, your school, your church, your ministry. You are such a great person. So busy, so busy, so busy, so busy. Come back to God. Don't give up. You are giving up the source of power, I tell you. By your plenty activities. You are giving up the source of your strength. The Lord is the strength. The Lord is the strength. Of my life. The Lord is the strength. The Lord is the strength. The Lord is the strength. Did you hear me? The Lord. Who is the strength? The Lord, the Lord is the strength. Amen. Amen. When David called himself the anointed what he was saying is that the Spirit is on me. Now when he says the Spirit is on me, what does it mean? The Bible says, now the Lord is that Spirit. It's the Lord who is the Spirit. When somebody is anointed, it means the Lord is with the person. Because the Bible says, the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now the Lord is that Spirit. So when the Spirit is on you, it means the Lord is on you. The Lord is with you. 
when Joshua was going to fight, he met a big commander. And he said, who are you? He said, I am come as a captain of the host of the Lord. So that was an invisible person with him. So when Joshua strikes one, the invisible one comes and just... So Joshua looked very powerful and very strategic, but actually the secret was the Lord who was fighting with him all the time. So the Lord is the strength. So when they asked Joshua, what is the strength? They said, oh, my strength is in my battalions and my ground troops. And, uh, and I want to write a book about airborne paratroopers. Joshua, you made a mistake. You should have been like David and just said, the Lord is the strength. Now the Lord is that spirit. So when you see somebody who has the spirit, who has the anointing, he has the Lord. That is what he has. He has the Lord. For the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, you are free. His blessing. May you enjoy the blessings of the Lord. May you enjoy the blessings of Jehovah. May you never give up what makes you really strong. May you never be deceived into thinking that something else makes you strong when it is actually the Lord who makes you strong. And the Lord who strengthens you. The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? Lord is the strength, the light and the salvation of my life. Whom shall I be afraid of? What shall I fear? That's why he always talked about the anointed, the Lord's anointed. He said, why do the heathen rage? Why? Why do the people imagine something that won't work? Something that won't succeed. Why do they always think against the Lord and his anointed. The Lord and his anointed. His anointed means a person on whom the anointing of the spirit is. And who is that spirit? The spirit is the Lord. The Lord is that spirit. So you see the person says, this is an anointed person. It means that the Lord is with the person in a certain way. That's the secret of the person. And so that's why when he does this, then the, the Lord comes invisible. Just like when I was preaching, it was like a vision. I saw this ghost here, standing here, like that. All of them trying to give you a message. They can't contribute anymore. Listen to what they are saying. You'll soon be like us. All they were saying was, you'll soon be with us. You'll soon be just like us. Where you can't be seen, you can't contribute, you can't say anything. Think wisely. Think carefully. The invisible people. I tell you, my friend, the invisible ones. The Lord. The Lord is the strength. What's your secret to the Lord? That's why I don't like that question. What's the secret of your life? So what, 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 are, what are some of the principles you find? Then I should answer, so the, Lord, the secret of my life, I wake up at 5 o'clock every day. The secret of my life is I work very hard. I work 18 hours a day. The secret of my life is that I have been to school for many years. The secret of my life is that I, I have a good wife. The secret of shut your big mouth. These are not the secrets of your life. The secret of your life is the Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came up against me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. Why? Because the Lord was the defense of my life. I couldn't defend myself, but the Lord defended me. Benny Hinn said something. He was talking about falling, you know, into sin. He said that one day he was so scared. He was saying, Lord, can I survive? Can I make it? And the Lord showed him a scripture. He said, in the scripture, he said, I find more bitter than death a woman whose heart is snares and nets. He said, in other words, one of the most bitter experiences in life is to meet a certain kind of woman who will destroy your life and hurt you. Then he, go, he went on and said, and the scripture continues and says, but whoso fears the Lord shall escape from such a person. It's not who he who is moral or he who is very principled or he, but if you fear the Lord, you shall escape. The Lord will cause you to escape. Just to escape. His power will cause you to escape.
from certain things. Wow. The Lord is the strength of my life. I want to be with the Lord. When, when, when sometimes when people, when I'm praying and people go, I say, I'm in a meeting. No, I don't say I'm praying. I say, I'm in a meeting. Don't, don't tell people you are praying. Just tell them I'm in a meeting. I can't talk to you now. I'm having a, I'm having a serious meeting. I can't talk. I'm in a meeting with I'm in a meeting with the, with the strength of my life. The Lord, the Lord who is the strength of my life. The source of my power. That I've decided not to give up. I won't give up my meeting with the Lord. I can give up my meeting with you. And I can give up my meeting with her. And I can give up my meeting with that person. But the Lord is the strength of my life. I can't give up my meeting with the Lord. Because it is the Lord who is the strength of my life. And therefore I can't give up that particular meeting. I can give up all the other meetings. But that meeting is a meeting I refuse to give up that meeting. Because it's the Lord who is the strength of my life. I don't mind forsaking my meeting with you. I don't mind if I'm tired, I can't talk to you. But the Lord, I can't afford to stop that one. Because, because the Lord is that spirit. And the Lord is the strength. The one who makes me strong. The American Bible says the Lord is the defense. He's the defender. When I went to Jessica, there was a lady, I don't know whether she was a witch or whatever, throwing things at me as I was preaching. With all her strength. I've never seen anything like that. Did you see, did you see her? Hey. When the scripture says, the Lord is the defense of my life. Nothing else can defend you except the Lord. I say, Lord, my eyes are on you. Fight against those that fight against me. Contend with those that contend against my soul. Take the shield and the buckler. The buckler. Rise to my help. Why do you give up your strength? Give up somebody else. Give up something else, but don't give up the strength of your life. Give up something else, but don't give up the strength of your life. Stop other things, but don't stop the Lord. What is the Lord? The Lord is my, my light. My light. It's the light of my life. My salvation. Say the one who's saving me always. The Lord is my strength. The strength of my life. Wow. It's not money. It's not England. It's not America. It's not your friend in England who is your strength. It's not your background. It's the Lord who is your strength. Hallelujah. How many realize that this is the greatest key? This is the greatest key. Wow. You are blessed. Father, we thank you for your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.